Hi, I'm Steve McShane. And I'm Aya Carroll. In this edition of Begin in the Garden, Steve will be our dirt whisperer, and he'll tell us what your soil is begging for for great garden results. We'll answer the question, organic, to be or not to be? We'll take you to a great Monterey County garden getaway, and we'll show you a garden dessert you can whip up in no time. All coming up next. Beginning in the garden. So, if it's not soil, it's fertilizer. And hopefully by now I've driven home the importance of fertilizer. And the key fundamental on fertilizer is to remember that there are 17 essential nutrients that plants need to survive. Just like human beings have essential nutrients, so do plants. So the most critical thing to remember so that you don't waste your money and waste your hard effort in the garden is to feed what plants want when they need it. The two most important times of the year to feed are the spring and the fall. In the spring, plants are growing. Leaf and stem growth are number one. In the fall, plants are storing energy for the winter. A lot of root growth. They're preparing themselves for the next spring, ultimately. So there's a wide variety of choices. The two main categories for fertilizers are organic-based and conventional fertilizers. So here we've got a wide variety of organic-based fertilizer. As you can see, many of them are formulated for specific crops we may want to grow. So this is a rose and flower fertilizer. This here is an azalea, camellia, and gardenia fertilizer. They vary in price, and in many cases, what you're really going to want to pay attention to is the ingredients and the numbers right here. These three numbers on a fertilizer bag or box indicate Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, N, P, and K. Those are the three most important nutrients out of the 17 that I referenced a moment ago. And depending on the type of crop, one may need more phosphorus, one may need more potassium. It's really going to depend. If you don't want to get bothered with it, the key thing to remember in general is more nitrogen in the spring, leaf and stem growth, and more phosphorus and potassium in the fall for that root growth and preparation for the next year's winter. So these are organic based fertilizers. By that, organic based means that they come from organic sources. They were derived from nature. Conventional fertilizers are a bit different. Those are actually manufactured by man by mechanical or chemical means. The plant doesn't know the difference between the two. It truly does not. But that said, various gardeners have different philosophies on whether they want to do organic or conventional. One thing to keep in mind, organic tends to take more time to show the results, whereas conventional takes less time. Organic's kind of like a good four-course meal. You'll see the results over time, <laughs> whereas conventional's like a candy bar. Almost immediately you see the results from a conventional fertilizer. Let's keep going and I'll show you some different types of fertilizer. Here we have liquid fertilizers. All fertilizers don't come in pelletized or in a form where you can sprinkle them. Many come in liquid form that are really, really, really easy to apply. Truly the plant doesn't know the difference. It's a matter of the gardener and the ease with which you may want to water your fertilizer, sprinkle your fertilizer, or just apply it when planting. One thing to keep in mind, all fertilizers do better if they're worked into the soil. Usually within the first inch or two of the soil horizon. One of the things I also say to people is that once they have fertilized, apply a top dress or a mulch over the top. This will prevent fertilizer from airing off into the environment and it will also prevent uh, animals or any kind of other you know, possible uh, distractions from keeping that fertilizer in and around the, uh, the roots. Feeding on a regular basis is really, really important. And I always tell people to feed in small amounts more frequently rather than one big giant dose of fertilizer at once. When you apply a giant dose of fertilizer, oftentimes it airs out into the environment or it goes through the root zone and can ultimately contaminate our water supply. So smaller amounts, when the plant needs it, it's going to save your pocketbook and also be good for the plant.
organic produce is very popular, but what about growing organic? Deputy Monterey County Ag Commissioner Ken Allen tells us just because you grow it in your home garden doesn't mean it's organic. Organic produce uh, is usually produced without the use of synthetic, uh, synthetically produced fertilizers or pesticides. Uh, it would be stuff that is uh, what you would consider natural or, or, no, or the use of no uh, pesticides. And the type of fertilizers they would use would be a type of like home composting, something like that. That uh, apparently is supposed to be healthier for you. There's no uh, less of a health risk, you know, with the uh, toxicity issues with pesticides or heavy metal issues sometimes with fertilizers. You're not going to have any of that type of an issue. And there is some anecdotal evidence to say that organically grown produce actually has a little bit better flavor and um, uh, more nutrients. You will find organically produced food, um, manufactured food, processed food, on the shelves in the grocery market now. And in farming here in the St. Williams Valley, many farmers are uh, delving into organic farming, and uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's a huge increase. I think that by and large, many gardeners, if they have a smaller type garden and they're producing it for their families, want to produce it. They already kind of are health conscious in general, and yeah, they want to produce organic food that is, um, or food that is pesticide free and heavy metal free from fertilizers. Home organic uh, farming is a, probably a complicated thing to do. It's very easy to grow in your backyard and not grow organically. With the use of any sort of a commercial pesticide, even no matter how small, that would automatically knock you out of being considered organic. Also the use of any sort of uh, commercial fertilizer that is not from an organic source. So it would be really easy for an organic or also the source of your seeds or your plants, if they are not from an organic source before that, then already you're sort of not organic. You're healthy but you're not necessarily organic. The most important component to any organic farming operation or farming growing operation, even a garden, backyard garden, would be the health of your soil. That's the key to everything. If you have good organic content or decaying organic matter in your soil, lots of minerals and nutrients for your plants, that's the key. In your home garden, it would probably most likely be composting would be a great source of, of fertilizer for your soil. If you have a good healthy soil, you'll have good healthy plants. They'll be able to fight off any type of disease or insects that come along. Um, and you won't need to resort to the use of pesticides. A home gardener has the choice to be conventional or organic, much, so, much easier so than a large-scale farmer because an, uh, a home gardener can plant a smaller amount of products or produce and the pest pressure that they're gonna be experiencing is much less significant. And just with good management practices and if needed, the occasional use of a, of a pesticide that's approved for use in organic um, would get you there. If you're lucky enough to have some fruit trees, Chef Todd has a great dessert that you can whip up on the grill in just a few minutes. Short and sweet. I'm Chef Todd and from the garden to the grill, today we're grilling white peaches and nectarines. Put them over a little angel food cake for a very sweet and unique dessert. First thing we better do is get some of that fruit right on the grill. So we're going to take our, our white peaches, and we're just going to run a knife very carefully right up to the to the seed itself, and then a nice mild twist will help remove that. Same on the next one. Do be careful because sometimes you can go through the pit, in this case where the pit's a little soft, and then we're just going to do a quarter on it as well. And same thing, just remove that pit right out of there. 
It comes out fairly simple when they're, if they're nice and ripe. Overly ripe, and you'll have squished fruit. So you do want to be careful. You want to pick nice, firm fruit. And just go ahead and remove any of that that's in there. So just very carefully, run your knife right around the pit, giving it one firm turn, and out comes the pit from the one side. Then on the other, you're just going to take that knife right back in to the, against the pit. And same thing, just a nice little bit of a pry, and out comes the pit. Just that simple. So now we've got the, this pit removed from all of our peaches and nectarines. I'm just going to go ahead and get those into a bowl. And it doesn't matter if they, you don't need to keep them separate. And we're going to toss those just in a little bit of grapeseed oil. And now grapeseed oil doesn't have much of a flavor. You won't, it's not distinctive. You won't, you, won't, you won't get a lot. If we put olive oil on here, you're going to have a very interesting kind of Mediterranean fruit relish. So with the grapeseed oil, we've got a much cleaner, it'll just add for some moisture to keep it from sticking on the grill and help us to really get that nice char happening without the, the, the fruit sticking and, and bruising and, and not, it'll stay not looking nice and beautiful. So after we toss those around, we don't need to add any sugar or anything to them. You can, we can add a little pinch of salt, which helps draw out all the natural flavor. But we've also got a little bit of maple syrup that we're going to take, and we're going to drizzle on there as well to help with that, that, sh that caramelization. And anytime you're grilling or caramelizing something, what you're doing is you're, you're cooking the sugars. You're grilling and, or, or burning the sugars slightly. So we're going to add just a little extra on there to give us that nice sweet caramelization, as well as another layer of flavor. When you add the maple, you know, it's, just, it's not just your standard grilled fruit, which was sweet and delicious. You've got a nice other component that'll work well with the smoke. They kind of play off of each other. So once we've got them coated, just go ahead and lay those on there. And again, it's not, doesn't matter if they get mixed up. Get those on the grill. You hear that beautiful sizzle. Now because of the, first of all, the sugar that's in the fruit and also the maple syrup on there, you do have to watch that we don't get too much caramelization too quickly. We do want the fruit to have time to soften as well. As, I, as I'm laying them on the grill, I'm putting the cut side of the fruit down first, so I have that nice surface area. I don't want the skin to get too much charred. The skin already has its own uh, little texture to it, so by, if we char the skin too much, we could actually add an undesirable texture to the, 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 the relish that we're making, the fruit compote. So once we can, so we can set that off to the side and we'll use that again when we bring it off the grill. It's going to take up just about a minute to two minutes on each side. And you'll see the ones we put on here first, just that quickly they begin to start to caramelize. So we're going to give that just a little more time, maybe move them a quarter turn. And the reason for cooking this fruit to begin with is one, we want to, we want to soften the, the, the fruit, add a little, another dimension of flavor, really give it some character that just a standard fruit compo wouldn't have that, that same uniqueness to it. We want something a little bit different. So I've got a beautiful angel food cake that we baked earlier and just a nice slice of angel food cake that we're going to put down into the bowl. We take some of those grilled nectarines. We're going to take that, that original bowl that we used that has a little bit of that grapeseed oil in there but not much. Put some of the, start putting that fruit back in there. Now that the fruit's nice and tender a couple of nectarines, a couple of peaches. Just give that a nice toss. Getting that, allowing that maple syrup to kind of recoat everything. And really, we're just a matter of taking our fruit and getting it into the bowl with that beautiful angel food cake. Take a little bit of that syrup that's been created from the hot fruit and this, this, the uh, maple. Just pour that right over the top. We've got a little bit of fresh mint. Put that right in there. I'm Chef Todd and from the garden to the grill, we've grilled some white peaches and nectarines, poured them over a little angel food cake with a little Vermont maple syrup. All we need now, finish it off a little bit, dress it up, and be ready to enjoy. They attack from above, they come up from below. Your garden can be a battle zone when it comes to pests and weeds. Bruce Weldon from the Monterey County Environmental Health Department has some safety tips for us about using chemicals in the garden. 
And if you watch closely, you can see him do battle with the gardener's nemesis. As a gardener, I'm kind of laissez-faire. And I like to let things go fairly naturally. And I don't really use a lot of chemicals except around the house where I spray for ants. Occasionally I get these ant infestations and I have to spray. I usually use diazonon, which isn't particularly dangerous, but if it's used improperly, it can be. There's a lot of great chemicals that have been developed over the years that we all take for granted and use, but even just because you buy it at Orchard Supply doesn't mean it's still potentially very dangerous to you and to the environment. You have to handle them carefully. You should always wear some kind of protective clothing. At the minimum, you should wear gloves and some kind of long sleeve shirt. You don't want to get any of that chemical on your skin because it'll go right through the skin and into your system. So gloves at a minimum, uh, eye protection oftentimes if you're spraying, long sleeve clothing so that you don't get it on your skin, and that's going to protect you. And then you want to be careful uh, that you handle it correctly, that you apply it in the way that the package direction says. And of course, like many things, bigger and more is not necessarily better in this case. You want to follow the directions religiously. Don't double the dose because you think it's going to do double the killing power. Those things are set up in a way to maximize the effectiveness of the product and you don't need to, to alter that. So unfortunately, we do have problems with people that uh, get exposed. Uh, you have to really expose yourself pretty significantly with chemicals that you would get at a local uh, garden supply to get that sick. But you can run into problems with uh, exposure that'll make you sick and you may not be sick enough to go to the doctor or the hospital, but it's going to affect your body. These are toxic chemicals. They're uh, many of them made to, to kill. And if you get it in your system, it's going to affect you. It may not kill you, it may not make you violently ill, but it's going to make you feel sick and it's not going to be good for your system over the long run. The best way to dispose of leftover uh, garden chemicals would be to take it to the local household hazardous waste collection facility. Here in Monterey uh, County, there's one at Sun Street in Salinas, and there's also one at the Marina uh, Landfill uh, over in Marina. Uh, both of those will accept chemicals from homeowners, and they'll get rid of it for you properly and take care of it. Now, if you have an empty container and you've really emptied it completely and then rinsed it out, putting the rinseate back into the sprayer so you get rid of that spray properly, not dumping it in the corner of the garden. Once that container's been triple rinsed, uh, you should be able to dispose of that in the garbage with your regular trash. You don't want to... recycle wanna, it? You could recycle it as well. I would probably err on the side of caution and put it in the trash. Uh, rather than recycle, just because the recycling uh, is exposing more people potentially. And if you don't do a real good job of triple rinsing it, you could be exposing uh, the person that's sorting that trash out to uh, chemicals. I've uh, had a vegetable garden for years and years, and uh, it's a, not a huge garden, but it's out there in the, in the real world. And I've been, I've been plagued with gophers, and I have tried everything to get rid of them. Uh, both nice and friendly and mean and nasty methods. And uh, what happens is you get rid of them, or I get rid of them, for a period of time, but they always come back. And they always seem to get me in the end. So uh, to be honest, what I've done is I've gone to container gardening. I've raised beds that have uh, a lining of chicken wire or, or metal mesh, and they can't get through it. And it's great. I can, it's actually better for my back because the raised beds are a little higher off the ground, so I don't have to bend over as far. And I get much better productivity from my garden. And the gophers are living over in the other part of the garden and happily eating whatever else is over there, and they don't bother me anymore. So you're like in harmony with nature. I am in harmony with nature. I fought for many years, and I have to say that I didn't win. They beat me but I've learned to coexist with the gophers by going to container or to raise beds. And that's a great solution if, uh, if people are plagued as I was, that you get a little bit of construction activity, but once you're done, you're, you're in great shape.
May and I have been working with, oh, that's always the working. May and I have been designing a garden space and now it's time to get those plants in the ground and see what will come out of it and grow. Before we plant, one thing that's important is just give everything a good drink. Good drink of water. Something to remember every time. Uh, just because for many cases, plants have suffered the transportation between, say, uh, the nursery and your backyard. So give everything a good drink and give it a chance to just kind of take in a little bit of water before you start planting. Now my, tr my garden area furrows are done, but where to put the plants? <laughs> what is your advice on how I strategize okay. my plants in the garden? Sure, well we gotta think height, the tallest in the back, your corn there, that'll probably get to eight feet. That's gonna be a tall crop. The tomatoes where you have them here are real good. Um, they're probably going to get four or five feet. You know, I've seen tomatoes go even higher than that, sometimes as high as six or seven. Uh, kind of in front of that, we have the peppers that'll get to about that height, mm. 18 inches. Okay. Uh, the zucchini there, uh, pepper as well. And then we have some open area in the front here. You could put some herbs in there okay. or maybe even some of the lettuces, whatever you don't want to put in the pots along the back. Yeah, this will work well. Okay. This is starter fertilizer, and it's a great addition to getting anything started, uh, whether okay. it be... Uh, fruit tree or vine or, or, mm -hmm. or vegetable. So, so what do we need? We're going to get a, maybe a handful here and we're just going to seed the furrow with some of this. Okay. There you go. More? No. That's good. I'm just going to kind of seed things along here where we're going to be planting. And what this does is it provides nutrients and getting it started and keeping things going through the season. So about a handful here for that. So you don't need a lot? Not a whole lot. Can no, people over fertilize? They can. <laughs> so I always tell people to really pay attention. Um, you know for the 12 plants we're starting you know, no more than a half a cup, or in the case of this, about a third a cup is going to be what we need. So really, it's easy to over-fertilize because you think more is better. That's right. Okay. <laughs> Finally, we're ready to put the plants in. Now, what's the secret for good transplanting? Okay. You just kind of give the bottom of the six-pack a good squeeze okay. and shuttle the, the plant out. Remember that a lot of times it's not completely germinated in some instances. Look at that. That's just perfect. Uh, and then you take What's there, make sure that the root ball is broken up, and in this case, uh, it's already ready to go. And now this is an important part. Now keep, keep in mind, we're always looking for debris. Oh. <laughs> so you can go ahead and get that guy. Okay. Well, we're gonna go down about three or four inches, open up a nice cavity, and set that corn in there, just like so. And boy, does that fit just perfectly. Boy, I'm still, it's amazing. A couple, three, four inches. Right, now, how far around. do you bury the root ball? Yeah. Just to about where you see the top. That top, yeah. Okay. That's, that's looking real good. Okay. These tomatoes are, what do we have? What uh, sweet 100. Oh, sweet 100. You got some cherry tomatoes. Yeah. They're going to get big, so it's something to keep track of. Okay. Don't be afraid to pinch back tomatoes. One thing to start with here, that starter fertilizer. Just a handful. Or a handful. Okay. A little bit more is okay. All right. And we're just going to seed that along here. Getting a good sized hole. Okay. Again, complimenting you on your soil. I mean, it's got really good um, loam to it. It's okay. very dry. So you're going to have to keep in mind, we've okay. watered these in advance, but one thing to uh, keep in mind is you're really going to have to water this a couple of times. Now, how much should you loosen the root ball? Can you be too hard on it and rip the roots? You, you, you can't be. You can be too hard, kind of giving it a light massage, breaking it up really gently. No wonder the plants like Not him. To disrupt you it give them much. a nice massage. It helps. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll sink that guy right in there. And let's just wrap the soil around it and we get the other okay. side there. Perfect. Well, the next step is to get everything watered now that we've got it planted. And boy, is it important. Um, it takes at least a week, if not more like two, for all of these plugs to get established. So giving them a good watering now, waiting a couple hours, watering them again, and watering them again tomorrow and the next day and the next day until the soil is nice and moist is gonna, gonna be beneficial. So we're gonna start by getting everything washed down and then we'll start with some watering. Hi 
Hi there, my name's Christine Windham, and this is my Shangri-La on the Central Coast. Now, it didn't always look this way, so I'd like to show you some things that we did. Got this property six years ago, and this whole backyard was just grass. Just grass. And I wanted a focal point, but we didn't have a big budget, so we started with the rose garden. That went in five years ago. And as you can see, it's filled in quite nicely. And then when we got a little bit more money, four years ago, we put the beds in. So all these trees, I tried to create a windbreak here, as well as over on the east side, as well as a backdrop. I couldn't afford to have a house on the central coast in Carmel or down in Big Sur like I would have liked to. So I incorporated Big Sur with the coast redwoods. And my focal point here is a water feature instead of the ocean. So if you'd like, we can come back into the rose garden and I'll show you the veggie beds. So this section I wanted, you know, to have plants and flowers, cutting beds, cutting flowers so that I could bring the outdoors in. And I wanted herbs that I would use, foods that I would use, and it's been kind of a test garden. Some things have lasted, like the sage, and other things come and go. But uh, through trial and error, it's been a lot of fun. It's low maintenance. I put everything on the drip, so it's as low maintenance as can be. The honeysuckle's filling in nicely, and I wanted it to be a scent garden as well. So all the roses, except for a couple, are Old English roses, which means they have a heavy scent, and the angel's trumpets, and then all the herbs including the geraniums. The geraniums are all scented. I love the concept of garden rooms and one of my uh, first inspirations were the gardens at Filoli, a grand estate that's just south of San Francisco. So there is a lot of wind and silliness and luckily I noticed when you're back in this uh, garden, there's not much wind, so I try to create more of a windscreen with the roses and despite gusty winds in the main part of the backyard. You can sit back here and it feels like 75 degrees with no wind, which is nice. The time does fly, so I put a clock in the, the garden back here so I can keep on top of that. And I'll show you another garden room, or pathway, I should call it, because it's really not a room. Come this way. I like to create paths because in life there's many paths that we can take and one is to the Himalayas. If you just walk this way through the silk trees, it'll lead you to a Himalayan poppy and a cedar deodora which are native to the Himalayas. And at the end of the path I put a little Stonehenge stack of rocks with a little peace rock at the base. So maybe you'll find peace if you go this way. And the last path that I have here just comes down this way and focuses on a little bird bath under a flowering plum tree. It's the least developed area of the yard and I kind of want it that way so it just cuts off nicely, makes you think, oh it's so nice, and then you turn the corner and see all the weeds. <laughs> but it is a nice path, it just draws your eye right to that one point and that's all it needs to do is go right there. So since I don't have the trust fund that I'd like to have, I created my little Shangri-La to incorporate a few different geographical areas that I love. Thanks for joining us on this edition of Begin in the Garden. We'll see you next time.